Right, Dima has welcomed everybody in the chat, so maybe I should start. Um, now, welcome everybody, whether you are a member of the Anglo-Jordanian Society or, or not. And if you're not a member of the Anglo-Jordanian Society, we sincerely hope that by the end of the evening you will be. And Dima tells me that there are many people who are new in terms of emails, so do give it a thought. Um, and thank you to Dima for setting this up. And there will be about an hour. We have to finish round about seven-ish. And um, there is the opportunity for question and answers once the Shah's finished speaking. Um, and you can do that through the Q&A. And at the bottom of the screen, there's a Q&A thing. So type your questions in there, and we will try to monitor it as best we can. Type the questions as, as they come to you, and then we will answer them, or Bashar will answer them at the end of the, of the talk. So either in the Q&A or in the chat, and we'll keep an eye on uh, both of those. So introductions. Um, as you can see from the screen, I am, well, it says Robert, but most people call me Bob. I am a trustee of the Anglo-Jordanian Society and have been for more years than I care to remember. And every time I try and resign, nobody will let me resign. However, fairly soon I will have to resign because I'm moving north and will be further away from London. But that's by the by. Um, I happen to have been working in Jordan for 26 years. I first visited Jordan in 1981 when I was lad, as they say, up north. Um, and have got to know Bashar over the last few years, not because he is the manager of the Man International, but because he is by his own description a man of mystery and we're about to find out about what that means um <laughs> but actually he's a professional photographer um i believe self-taught self-taught and he probably knows more about the archaeology and history and the landscape of jordan than probably anybody else um he is the perfect person to be talking to the anglo-jordanian society because he is anglo-jordanian um he nearly had a problem with the time because he wasn't sure whether we're three hours ahead or three hours behind. But anyway, we're all here on time. Um, he is professional photographer, author, enthusiast for the heritage, passionate for the past, and has joined us on many, many times in our in the helicopters. Because one of the things I do in my spare time is run the Aerial Archaeology in Jordan project. So, and we have been on a few field trips, and I'm hoping there will be future field trips uh, as the years roll by. So the great thing about Bashar is he's always willing to have a go and he's always on the go. He's always full of ideas for exhibitions and everything else. So he keeps me on my toes and we thought it would be a good idea to hear what he's up to, how he came to do what he does. Um, and hopefully he will be plugging his books as well. Um, many books on on uh, wonderful photographic expeditions i don't know whether you're going to get any pictures of japan because i know he just come from back from japan but we will see so bashar <laughs> over to you and um dima and i will keep an eye on the question and answer thing so do if you've got any questions uh that will be sort of the last 20 minutes or so okay bashar all yours all right well hello everyone uh thank you for the introduction bob um, I usually take a bit of time to get rolling here, so bear with me. But uh, I prepared like a good 70 pictures for, to share with everyone, including pictures from Japan. Um, let me just uh, switch over to my share screen and I can walk everyone through it. All right. I hope everyone can see that. Can anybody uh, like yeah, pop in? Yeah, Bob, looks, can you that, see that? That looks good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Full fine. screen. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Well, <clears throat> uh, usually I don't really prepare heavily for for like talks like this because I like to wing it. When I prepare too much, I get nervous and start stuttering and forget things. So what I do is I plan out the pictures to show everyone, and you'll you know you'll get to see some lovely pictures, and I actually get to add some more uh, information as I'm going along. Um, we've got about like I said about seventy photos to show you. And within that, I will be telling stories of how I came to, you know, start this and what I did and where I've been. Um, so I'm a Jordanian and half a Jordanian, half English. My mom's from Leicester. Um, I grew up in Jordan and uh, I have, you know, I've been exploring its ruins for like my whole life. Whenever, you know, family used to come from abroad, 
mum would pack us into a, a a bus and just ship us off into some site. So I've been you know exploring like a lot of Jordanian sites for since I was kids. Um, but I really started you know photographing around 2004 when I got my first camera and I just started walking around and taking pictures. Uh, that didn't really, you know, blow into full-blown uh, professionalism up until about 2014. And, and um, how I came about it, I mean, when I was a lot younger, I used to, you know, when, when I, with my camera, I used to skip university and just go off on adventures to castles around because everything was so accessible and so close to me. And um, I think around 2012, 2013, I was really eager to... Um, to publish a book like I, I'm in love with books and I love the art form and I love you know creating something like that and I remember reaching out to a, a photographer who I admired and he said to me well pick a topic and just stick with it and develop that so around uh, 2012 uh, sorry 2013-14 I started I picked up a guidebook and I started exploring all of Jordan's uh, heritage and archaeology sites and uh Here's the, the one of the first sites that I actually like, you know, started on. This is Qasr Bashir. And um, that project, you know, grew significantly uh, over the years. Within about, you know, the first, I think, year and a half or two years, I had covered about 130, 140, um, you know, archaeological sites as well as religious sites and, of course, natural sites. Um, I call I, I consider myself a historical photographer, and no matter how much I Google it, I don't I've never I've not really heard of another historical photographer out there. People would call me a landscape photographer, possibly, or even a travel photographer, but I I don't like those terms because they feel like you know I, you know it's not my home. Like I, you know I can pop out in ten minutes, I'll be in a, you know a two thousand year old site. So you know historical it is, and I I kind of like that title. Um, so throughout that first project, as I was going along, you know, I was exploring all these sites and discovering beautiful places. And by the way, anybody has anything in the Q&A, if you guys want to start guessing where these places are, you can always have a bit of fun with that. Um, yeah, so, you know, I spent a good year exploring and, uh, you know, logging sites. Uh, it started like, you know, like I said, it starts snow snowballing in terms of, you know, exploring sites. Uh, you know, I would get one guidebook, then another, and then another, and then I would start expanding into finding other books. And that's also how I found met Bob, uh, because at one point I picked up the Aerial Archaeology Over Jordan book, and I was so impressed with it <laughs> that I reached out to them. Uh, at the same time, I reached out to my good friend Jane, who I think is probably in the chat as well here. Um, and, you know, we we developed a good friendship and she ended up like supporting me on the project and becoming like a co-author on the first book that I made. Um, uh, uh, so uh, as I went on with that, you know, like uh, uh, Jordan is just so, you know, I, I, it's hard to like find the words, but there's, I've been photographing it for like, you know, professionally for over a decade now. So, uh, and I still find new sites constantly. Like people come up to me in exhibitions and be like, you know, have you visited this site? And I'll be like, no, that, that I bet that's just a bunch of rubble. Uh, <laughs> you go out there and, and lo and behold, there's like entire, you know, building with, you know, uh, all kinds of you know, additions to it from different eras. And as you're going along, you you know, you sort of pick up on these things and you start, to, you know, learning and like, you know, being able to identify it, you know, other sites. And it's just it's just a, such a beautiful thing. And Jordan's the be perfect place for it, you know, Um as of as of me possibly last week, I've visited and photographed and documented over 350 locations in Jordan, and that's not including the aerial flights where we you know we we do 200 300 sites in a single flight sometimes. Um, uh, going back to that that first book, uh, it was completed in around 2018. Um, it's called A Map and a Lens Jordan, and in it I managed to squeeze in about 100 and 20, 130 sites, and the book was broken down chronologically. So, you know, uh, you'd have sites from each era or the closest associated sites to each era, because of course, Jordan is a land where people, you know, things are built on top of each other. So, you you know, you'd find like, for example, here, this is the Qatarani Hajj fort, but like there's evidence that there was an Abitian fort underneath it. So, you know, when when trying to you know build a book or build an archive, you, you're always at a loss as what to what era you should associate it with. Um, this is uh, this is one of the religious sites that I photographed, and it's probably one of my favorite sites in in Jordan. This is the tomb of, Mount, uh, of Aaron, the prophet Aaron, 
and it's on the highest peak in Petra. And, uh, I, you know, every chance I get, I try to get out there and like go, go and spend a night up there and explore and just enjoy the views and the, and the distance. Um, after I published the first book, uh, I just, you know, I'm always on the go, as, as Bob said, and I'm always trying to think of new projects and things. So what I decided to do was I uh, wanted to do like I, I, I vary from a lot of people say that I uh, switch between documentary and art. And I, I and like I, I walk a fine line between the two. So uh, my second project, which hasn't really, really come to fruition, but it's still growing, <laughs> is Jordanian landscapes. So here I sort of departed from the usual, you know, uh, format of photographing. And I decided to opt it for like really beautiful panoramas. And this might be a book one day, a small print run at some point uh, where, you know, I just, you know, share these vast and varying landscapes to people. Uh, it, some of it includes, you know, um, archeological remains, but while others are just natural. Um, you know, here here you have like, and like one of the things that I do love to do and what I, when I did emphasize in, in, in the books and the projects I work on is I like to reflect uh, how varied Jordan is and how much is, is available to see here. Like a lot of people, because I also work in the hospitality industry, it, it frustrates me endlessly because people come here for the golden triangle, you know, and if they're, if they're lucky, you know, it's, either, it's, you know, Jarash and Ajlun. Uh, Petra and Wadi Rum, and if and that's if you're lucky, they might just come to Petra. They might just visit Wadi Rum. So one of my goals and my passions is expressing to people around the world, you know, how varied Jordan is, and you know, it's not just this desert place. We have highlands, we have you know waterfalls, we have all kinds of beautiful scenery, you know, that you wouldn't think existed in Jordan. Um, here's just one of my, another one of my favorite panoramas include, this was actually the cover of my, of the first book that I made. And this is an abandoned Ottoman era, uh, village in Ajlun, which is still abandoned. And like, you know, you often drop by what I do now is once I finished, you know, now I finished my books, uh, if it's a beautiful day outside, I'll just pick a direction and get in the car and drive up there to check on sites or, you know, reshoot old things. Um, moving on, there's more, some beautiful natural landscapes as well. And, uh, you know, as well as, you know, like there's, like I said, like there's bodies of water that even the thing is also, I was really surprised with the, the fact that like a lot of locals don't know a lot of these places. And uh, I like to call it the backyard syndrome when a lot of people say, you know what, I'll, I'll visit it later or I'll see it later where I try to really encourage people. Uh, I've, I like, I've held a couple of really good exhibitions over the last few years, you know, exhibiting a lot of this stuff and trying to highlight it for people as well as like, uh, I've done a, a few talks here and there uh, around the world. Um, here's an example of like a nice waterfall next to an Ottoman era uh, mill uh, in the north of uh, north of Amman, which is quite hidden. Uh, here's a, a beautiful panorama of salt. Uh, so basically, like I, I started, I, you know, I, I just went around going back to places that I fell in love with the, in the first few years uh, and went back and like just tried to get like these beautiful panoramas in the right conditions. And this is why, like, I, I going back a bit, like, I don't consider myself a landscape photographer because I just don't have the patience for it. <laughs> you know, I'll deal with the conditions that are out there or I'll head out when the conditions are right. But, like, it's 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 known that, you know, a landscape photographer will, um, will you know, uh, plan out meticulously and spend hours in one corner. No, I don't I do not do that. I just, I like to walk around. And this is the thing about, like, what I like to do is because, Usually with uh, travel sites and exploration sites, um, you know, you're limited, like, you know, you, you're, you're, there are restrictions and there's, it's basically like a puzzle because you, you get to an archeological site. And first of all, there's times where you can go in. And so, you know, you have to plan it out that you get there for the right light. If you need the right light, you have to dance around, you know, uh, people, you know, tourists and people exploring these sites. And some places are really, you know, busy where others are empty. For example, this, this site in Finan, this is an old, uh, an arch from a town, a Byzantine era town in Finan in the south. Um, so yeah, there's this like massive challenge of, of which I love to do because when once you get to this area, you're like, you have to find the right angle, you have to plan the right lighting and just deal with it in the moment and unlock that puzzle to find like the perfect image of what you're trying to get. Uh, sometimes it's hit and miss. Um, you know, as a photographer, uh, when I first started, you know, I get, you know, 10 good shots out of a thousand now. I get a hundred <laughs> good shots out of a thousand and still there's a lot that gets tossed away. 
um, continuing on through some of the really beautiful panoramas of Jordan. Uh, this picture, for example, reminds me of, of the second book that I ended up publishing uh, two years ago. Um, uh, um, the Petro National Trust and ICOMOS, uh, led by Her Excellency Princess Di uh, Dana Firas, she reached out to me about two years ago and said to me she really wanted to make a nice art book about uh, Jordan's UNESCO World Heritage Sites. So uh, I got really excited. It was the middle of COVID and I was like, yes, I will do that on the condition that you give me permission to go out and like explore these places. So we ended up uh, spending the second part of COVID with my assistant, just driving around a very empty and beautiful Jordan, exploring all these sites and photographing them for this book that was published uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, it's called Sites and Steen Stories Untold. And it's, it's, it's deviated a bit from my usual style of, of uh, documentary, photography and bookmaking because it was more of an art book. It's a beautiful square format. Um, of course, all these books, I, I didn't really want to share them here. You guys can go to my website and, and check them out. Like there's a whole bookshop there if you want to go and look at the books and see what I've done. But uh, I'm, I, wanted, I wanted to spare, you know, share more of the experience of exploring these sites. Um, jumping to another really interesting project that I did. This never really turned into a... Uh, a um, a book project, but uh, it was one of my favorite things that I did in Jordan. So uh, once I built up like a good, like reasonably good network in Jordan, I went to the Department of Antiquities and I requested permission to visit 17 to 25 sites at night because I really wanted to show this sort of interaction or uh, this romantic state of Bruins at night. Because you know, like uh, tourism has, is is a very recent thing. These ruins have been sitting on the you know alone and quiet, you know, frequented by uh, you know farmers and herders over the years. So uh, you know, like it, it's only a really relatively new occurrence that tourism has appeared in these places. So I wanted to go out there, and I just wanted to show the sort of quiet abandon of these sites. And it it was a personal challenge to me because you know, I've not really you know, a nightscape photographer. So I had to teach myself how to like go out there and take these photographs. Uh, a lot of people ask me how it's done. You know, it's it's done with a tripod and uh, it's done with also a bit of light painting. So, you know, you put your camera on your tripod and you get a whole bunch of flashlights and a bunch of, I call them victims, uh, assistants who you drag out at two o'clock in the morning into sites. So for example, in this picture, I had two friends in one building on the left, lighting that building up. I had another friend in the one right. And I was in the background lighting the foreground here lighting it up and uh, the project was was just so much fun uh you know going out there and like exploring these sites and being on your own and seeing them at night um and you know it uh, the light and the stars here you know of course i've edited the photographs a little bit not much but i brought out the stars a bit but like when you're out there you can see a good percentage of them like for example those first two shots that i just showed you the milky way was visible you know um, of course, it depended on how close you are to the cities. For example, here, this is in Jarosh. The city's like blown out the sky and the, the lower part. So you couldn't really get a good you know, view of the stars, but it still you know, has an impact. You can also see the city lights you know, uh, hitting across the, the, um, the, the seats of the theater. Uh, here's another one at sunset. I'm not sure if you can see the whole thing or, the, or it's cut off at the bottom, but um, this is Qasr Bashir one of my favorite sites that I mentioned earlier on. Um, and uh, this ended up turning into a, an exhibition that was shown about two years ago or three years ago in, in Jordan. And uh, ever since then, I've been, I've been really wanting to like, do more of this. Uh, I was asked by a publisher to see if I could like, explore more of the region, but it would, turned out to be a very difficult task, you know, trying to get access, as well as like, certain countries... Um, for example, Lebanon is so light polluted. It's, it's you know, the, the significant sites that you'd want to shoot, uh, you know, that's too hard. They won't, you won't, you'll just get a blown out sky. This is in Wadi Ram um, with some, you know, in, you know, art inscriptions and petroglyphs. And this is, this reminds me of another project, which I'm currently working on, and I hope to be able to follow up on it. Uh, Jordan's desert uh, is absolutely filled with all kinds of, of beautiful rock art and inscriptions. And it's been a passion of mine. I think Barbara, who's on here, will know this because I, I approached her a few years ago about it, but I think I'm going to still try to follow up on it. Um, it's been a passion of mine to go and document some of the more beautiful. They call these panels. Like, so this, this whole rock face is a panel and it's just a mixture of eras, peoples, you know, different graffiti all over the world. And, um, 
you know, I I just wanted to go out there and sort of like bridge the gap between the scientific community who've documented these sites and the, um, you know, the general public who are not really aware that we've got such an expansive gallery, you know, with tens of thousands in the north and even even more in the south near Wadi Rum. So that's probably one of the next projects that I'm hoping to work on. I, I'm thinking of uh, applying for a grant to see if I can actually get the funding for it. Um, moving on, here's some more some more night photography and uh, explore, you know, sites. Uh, photographing Petra at night was absolutely amazing as well. Um, and the thing is, like I said, like you know, the difference between photographing at night and photographing during the day. You know, in the day you you're restricted or you are bound by the sunlight. You know, you have to go in the morning or in the evening to get a really nice hue. But at night, uh, you know, it's a whole different ball game because you are the one who's painting these structures. You you got you know you got to fi figure out how to color them in in the correct manner. You know, uh, and uh, it was really interesting because you have to treat the subject sort of like, um, uh, you know, you're taking portraits of people. So, and for example, here, you know, I have a key light on the bottom right, which would cast shadows to make, you know, bring out the, to make the structure pop. And so like going to these places and figuring out puzzles. So in this shot, if you can see at the bottom left where the, the, the light is the strongest, you can see one of my assistants standing there with the, with the flashlight <laughs> as I took the shot. Um, so yeah, this was like I said. This is this has just pulled out this whole new experience of just exploring these places in the dead of night with like one or two people accompanying you, and really experiencing them on your own, and also for trying to figure out the puzzle of like you know reflecting it and showing it to others. Uh, let's move on from this onto the next project. Well, it's not really a project. Uh, Bob and the uh, uh, APAAME uh, project, or the, also the Aerial Archaeology of Jordan project. Uh, Bob and, and his team have invited me up through, I think I've flown with them about 10 times over the last seven years. And, uh, you know, I will never forget the first time I went up there, like I was strapped into the, into the, you know, seat and I just absolutely, uh, in, in, enjoy, enjoyed it. And it was probably the big turning point of where I actually started to consider myself a professional, uh, because, or even like a bit of an expert on Jordan. Because I was sitting in the back, not connected to the system with it, where they were talking, and I could tell exactly where we were going, what's the next site we were going, just based on where we were flying. You know, I could say like, oh, we're, we know, oh, this is, you know, Jarosh. Okay, the next area we're going to be visiting is this, you know, ruin here. And I realized to myself while flying up there um, that I really knew the country very well. And uh, ironically, because of the war uh, in Palestine. I had other projects set up and I was planning on working on like doing a um, Crusader Castles book. Uh, unfortunately, you know, that, that sort of got halted and I came back last month and I was thinking to myself, like, what's something very beautiful that I could work on that I can access. And just, uh, it just so happened to be that the Amman Image Festival is being, um, yeah, they, they do it every year and they've been doing it for about 12 years. So they are going to be exhibiting or doing the, holding the festival in a couple of months from now. So I decided to challenge myself and uh, exhibit these photographs at that, participate in the thing, showing these beautiful shots. But at the same time, what I want to do is I'm going to be publishing a very limited, you know, 500 copy uh, art book of the sites and the stuff that I photographed while up in the air with the team. And it's it, the emphasis is not on the archaeology. It's on the ortho photography, which is basically this beautiful way of photographing directly down where there, where everything is even. And while I was up in the air, I would often like look down and see these beautiful textures that I really just enjoyed photographing. And after about, you know, like 10 flights, I had a huge collection. So I'm currently building this really beautiful art book, uh, which combines these sort of the scenery that you see. I think we'll move on to um, the orthophotograph photography in a bit. Oh, here we go. So, and then mixed with these like sort of, you know, artistic uh, textures that you, you know, that you see, oh, not see, you can see it on satellite imagery, but you know, when I'm flying out there, I can see and form a composition correctly uh, and bring certain things out that I found interesting while flying up there. Um, so that book is in the process and the big challenge is to get it published within three months. And usually my average is about two years, two and a half years, but, uh, this is a smaller book and it doesn't have much writing. So I'm hoping fingers crossed that the book will be published in time and ready, like to, to, uh, be given out and like shared with the world in a few months from now. 
the the plan is uh, 29th of April. Um, here's some more shots from the dam. This is one of the the uh, dams in the north. Um, now moving on a little bit. So like not only do I photograph Jordan, but I've also been exploring the world uh, consistently. So every whenever I have some downtime and I have some free time from work, I plan out like a ten day to two week journey somewhere. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, like I think I've photographed about 350 sites in Jordan. I've also finished photographed about 350 sites worldwide. Um, and I'm and growing. So uh, as Bob said, I had just come back from Japan from a really beautiful trip. Um, and uh, while I'm out there, you know, I've I uh, I focus on other things that I'm really passionate about. And I hope that one day I'll be able to to, you know, create a book out of. So one of my passion projects, as you can see here, is um, mosques. And it's a slow, slow book. I keep joking about it. Like I'll probably finish it when I'm, you know, 80 because I, you know, I basically built a, a book about of 80 mosques that I think are beautiful and I'm interested in. And I'm, I'm going around the world to photograph them whenever I get a chance, of course. So, you know, for example, this is Tunisia. Uh, another one of my projects is the, uh, an architecture of antiquity book or uh, it's, it changes uh, ever so often. Currently, the current form of this book is how to build Roman city where I go around the world, I'm, I'm trying to locate the most uh, preserved or restored Roman elements of, of a city. So for example, here in, uh, this is in Turkey, this is a, a really preserved wall, which I, I wanna include in my book. Of course, these are all side projects that like I do for enjoyment and also like in the hopes of building uh, <laughs> a book. Here's one of the castles in Southern uh, Lebanon, uh, Crusader era castles that I wanted to do, you know, add to my project. Of course, like, you know, there's the enjoyment, again, of going there and like arriving on time and getting the right angles, the right, like, you know, and, and being rewarded with getting that shot that you're really happy with once you leave. Uh, again, Lebanon. Uh, this is a gymnasium in uh, in Turkey. Uh, some uh, tombs in Anatolia, Turkey as well. And uh, so what I do when I travel is like I, I know I log in all the heritage sites and, um, you know, and UNESCO sites and I just plan my trips out. And they're usually like crazy because I, I do like, you know, 10 cities in 14 days or, you know, like, you know, 30 sites in 14 days, you know, where I just hop out, you know, going from places to place. And like I've got I've gained a wealth of experience in traveling and how like different countries operate and how to get around in different places. And that's a part of the fun as well, because, you know, planning beforehand, getting the shots. You know, worrying all the time that you've got the shot, then coming back and realizing that you've got the right shot. Uh, this is uh, another beautiful shot from Saudi Arabia, Al uh, where Jane Taylor invited me out there to photograph and document the site for her upcoming book. Hopefully, it'll be around soon. Uh, here's a shot for, of a temple in Greece, for example. Uh, one of the mosques in Uzbekistan, where was one of my favorite places that I visited. Uh, a random shot of India, Varanasi, India, and the Ganges, which was an extremely unique uh, experience as well. Uh, like I, I often say to people that this is like uh, also an experience. Like you don't really learn about these places and these peoples until you actually get out there and start exploring it. You can read ten books, and you know they won't be the same as actually getting out there and interacting and seeing the places for yourself. Uh, and here's, uh, as promised, uh, <laughs> the last two shots of Japan that I took last uh, December. Uh, this is from Kyoto. And so is this one. Um, we're nearing the end, everyone. Um, uh, the last bit that I just want to talk about is my third book, which I published, which was a, a huge passion project. Um, uh, uh, at the Right be before um, COVID, I, set, I was in Jerusalem and... As I mentioned, I absolutely love books, as you can see behind me. Um, and I was searching for a, a decent book about Al-Aqsa, uh, you know, the third holiest site in Islam, and, and it, which takes up a huge chunk of Jerusalem, for those who don't know. And I was looking for a good English book, which explored, you know, a good photography book, which explored its sites and things. And I couldn't find one. And I remember sitting in one of the cafes nearby the the Dome of the Rock and the light bulb popped open. And I was like, you know what? Maybe I'm the person to do this because I, I'm able to access it, you know, with my British passport and, you know, and my my skills as a photographer. So I spent uh, two years uh, going back and forth. I, of course, I, it, it delayed, it, COVID delayed me by significantly. But during that time, I collaborated with Dr. Robert Schick to do the text of the book. Um, and uh, it, the book was published last March. 
Um, and I'm, I'm extremely proud of the project. I, at the time, it was my magnum opus. Like it was the thing that I really wanted to do to share with the world. And, um, you know, it, it was quite successful, which I'm very happy about. And people still reach out to me all the time for, for images and for information about the site because, you know, spending two and a half months, you know, in a dispersed on the site, uh, befriending everyone, hearing the stories, learning the history of each and every single, um, you know, uh, uh, sites you know or not sites like let's say landmark on the on the in the complex the complex is 144 uh, acres so it's massive and there are hundreds i call it an open air museum and of course with my with my you know background i was able to access all kinds of parts that other people could not access and um yeah, it was it was just a very unique project, and I'm very happy that I managed to do like an international thing that was beyond Jordan for a change, and uh, you know get out there and challenge myself and challenge the circumstances of of the you know being out there. It was it was it was very hard, you know, completing the project in terms of gaining access to the site, dealing with the security at the at the gates all the time, um, you know, or, or the border guards, things like this. Uh, here's some more images from uh, the interiors. Um, and well, that's me. That's that. This is my indicator that this is the end of, of what I was presenting. <laughs> uh, that's uh, one of my favorite pictures that Bob took of me taking a nap in the helicopter after I, we finished the flight. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, everyone can, uh, if you ever want to find out more or what I'm up to, you can go on to Amapel Lens. That's my website. Uh, I, I put all my pictures on, on there. I usually update. I update it constantly. So, if, for example, this talk will be up there when when it's ready. Um, and I also have a bookshop on there. If everyone's interested to to buy books, I dispatch internationally or locally, whatever you guys like. <laughs> and uh, that's me. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Bashar. That's fantastic. And um, I'm glad you put your website up there because I realize I put it in the chat, but the chat's only going to us as panelists and Dima, I think. So <laughs> you, that's it. So Map and Lens, have a look at it and you can see all the information on there. And um, one of the things that you've done, I think, is show that the heritage is all around us. And I think the point you made about it's on your doorstep. And if you don't go and see it, don't delay, because if you do delay, it may not be there. Oh, yeah. Um, and you've also mentioned, obviously, an inspiration to both of us, Jane Taylor and her work in Jordan. Um, so thank you, Jane, for that. And, and we are looking forward to your book. Um, <laughs> other things that you'll notice in Bashar's photos is just how many clouds there are. Now, to an aerial archaeologist, the last thing we want are clouds because they get in the way. But when you're flying with Bashar, he loves the clouds. So we had to abandon the flight in November because not only were the clouds there, they were also getting low. And he was really disappointed because that <laughs> bring that, you know, his photography is art. And that's what's wonderful. And I've always thought that aerial archaeology is a form of art, but we're also archaeologists and therefore we've got document it. We've got to document it as well. But if you can combine the art with the documentation and, and what Bashar does and the, the, the keep that picture on, because as next to his elbow, you can see there's actually a trap door. Oh, I can well, get I've never the, thought about the mouse there to show everyone. So there you are. Yeah. So every now and again, I turn around and there he is with his head down this bloody trap door. If he dropped his camera or fell through it, that would be the end of him. But that's where he's getting those vertical photos, which, again, are part of the art. And it's fantastic. Um, and the crew seem to think it's perfectly safe. And that's all fine. So wonderful. Um, <laughs> the night photography was great because, again, he's creating his own light. Whereas in the helicopters and the aerial photography we do, we're, we are totally dependent on um natural light and i have i have wondered in my in my dreams of doing not necessarily jordan from the air at night but actually taking because isn't it fantastic when you fly at night on a clear night you see particularly i remember get flying to jordan and you see parts of either italy or croatia when you just see the light like little spider webs now trying to photograph them is impossible from a from a commercial jet but it is a wonderful thing um so thank you for that and, and highlighting what you've done. And I encourage everybody to look at your website. Um, there are a few things in the chat, but I'm going to read those. I'm going to ask you two questions. And right. while you're answering those, I'll, I'll, I'll read the other the questions and stuff. So the first question is, and, the, and the, they're, they're kind of similar questions. The first question is, 
what would you say is your favorite location in Jordan? <laughs> um, and why? And I'll, for Jordan, I'll allow you three. But then also, what's your favorite location outside Jordan? And I'll only leave you one. All right, let's see now. So it's it shifts, right? So when I first started photographing, it used to be Qasr Bashir, which I showed like at the beginning. Like yeah, yeah. the way that 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 just is quietly abandoned and like untouched. It just it just it checks every single check mark for me, like as a photographer, as an explorer, as someone who loves this stuff. You know, being alone in that area, it's it shifted a little bit. Then it, it went to uh, a place called Abila, which is in the northern part of Jordan. It's yeah. a Decapolis city. Uh, yeah, yeah. which was which is not very much excavated so when uh, you're up there you know you see picnic goers a couple of picnic goers but then you're on your own and if you go out there in spring you just sit on top of this mountain and you just see you know a, a half buried theater in the hillside you know and yeah, yeah. It, it's sort of romantic in in, in my own in my own uh, <laughs> views so that that's number two yeah now, the yeah. recent my recent favorite is wadi dahik <laughs> uh, <laughs> and and that's not even an archaeological site, but it's 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 sort of my replacement no, for no. Wadi Rum because there's too many people in Wadi Rum yeah. now. <laughs> so Wadi Dlahek is Were you on the, the flight with us? Yeah, yeah, that yeah. Was yeah the I got one, the really white one. You were on the flight. That was great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Wadi Dlahek is known as Jordan's White Desert, and it's uh, it's in the east yeah. of Jordan near the Saudi border, and it's it's like he's got these beautiful white cliffs all around with a nice valley in the middle. Uh, it's very quiet and very and like very you know when you go out there there's no cell phone signal for example so you know, I like to go camping yeah. and, and enjoy the space out there alone on, even on weekends there's not barely anyone out there so I'd say those are my current three yeah. of favorite in Jordan. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, we'll and, come uh, back. To, there are other questions. We'll come back to the other one outside in a minute. Let me just do these other questions. So right. Debbie Flynn, who is the chair of the Anglo Jordanian Society, actually says she said thank you so much for such a brilliant and inspiring presentation. It's Debbie here, chair of the AGF. I would love to know if you had a favourite place in Jordan and why. Well, you've answered that one. And then she puts in brackets. Also, Bob, why have I never been invited in your helicopter? <laughs> well, Debbie, you're invited anytime you like. We should be flying in the first week in March. If you're in Jordan, you can come along. Um, so, actually, now, I, should, I should add uh, something Steve... there. I, uh, I should I should add when I when I first met Bob and the team, I kept on I, I I you know sort of hinted you know hey guys, I've got a camera. Can I come on your flights? And they didn't they didn't register it I, until I got more and more aggressive. <laughs> until I got to the yes. point where I was like, when are you taking me up there? I want to fly. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a very long queue and you've got to be very late <laughs> to get in. So that's fine. Um, you just got to be persistent. Uh, Steve Cogwell, who's a, a friend from a very long time ago, says, comment, not a question. Bashar, you would love a major exhibition by Edward Bertinsky, if I pronounce that right, which is on in London at the Saatchi Gallery. If you get a chance, it's on until the 6th of May. Definitely so, check it out. I'll make a note of that. And then uh, Richard Ritzo Hill says, hi, really interesting talk. Thank you. I'm a trustee at the Palestine Exploration Fund. I'm interested to know if you have documented or noticed changes in archaeological sites in Jordan over the years, such as damage or development. Yeah. And have you noticed any trends? Um, now, Bashar, if you want to answer that, you can, but I can chip in as well. Yeah, oh, I've, I've got I was actually thinking of adding a bit of that, the price of, of like exploring Jordan. Um, Jordan has an epidemic of looting, um, so unfortunately. And even since I started as a young guy, I'll, I'll give multiple examples of this. And I, I wish I could have shown some pictures. Um, let's see. One of my favorite uh, stories to tell people, and I've been saying this for the past, uh, you know, five or six years, in Abila, which is one of my favorite sites. Um, it's a Decapolis city, so you know, Roman Byzantine era. On one of the hills, it's just filled with tombs, and they're all painted. And there was this specific tomb that I'd found online when I was doing my research. And I can't remember which what number it was, but I call it tomb 60. It might have been tomb 45 or something. And it was just a beautiful shot of two griffins on either side of this tomb. And in the middle was a painting of a woman crying. And uh, when I saw this picture, I was like, I have to get to this shot the site. You know, I, I'm desperate. I, this is such a beautiful shot. It also reflects, uh, I kind of, regard that as our valley of the kings because there's so many painted tombs in that area that are you know underdeveloped and un unexplored so i set about you know finding any way possible to find it you know started emailing 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 and i finally got to one of the research teams the archaeological teams who were working on that site you know in the in the early 2000s and they said to me oh well we'll put you in touch with one of the locals who worked with us but we warn you, we've recently heard that like looters have gotten to it. And I, I thought to myself, oh, again, what's the damage? 
And and I will emphasize here that they had sealed, once they found the tomb, they had resealed it with concrete so no one would access it. Anyway, I, I got the number of this guy, called him up and say to him, like, there's a specific tomb I want to see. Can you take us? He agreed. And he was like, are you sure you want to see this? It's quite destroyed. And I was like, you know what? I, I'm, I've been trying to see this for so long. I want to get out there. Anyway, he takes us to this place. And, you know, we, we were Indiana Jonesing, like climbing down to the shaft that had been destroyed and drilled into. And I, I, I swear to you, they had heavy industrial equipment in there, had spent about a week, completely car destroyed the, the interior, taken the Griffins to be sold. And it was uh, it was absolutely ruined. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one of the extreme cases but like even you know other another story is when i first started i used to go there's a place called al qastal which is a uh, uh, early islamic palace on the on the airport road and i used to go pass by it because it was one of the easier access ones when i was younger before i even like started photographing and i forget like, i remember like walking around them being you know mosaics everywhere you just act, park your car and you like within about five meters you're seeing beautiful mosaics on the floors the first thing about this site was, is that one of the local, you know, people, one of the local people had got, apparently got permission to build a house, ended up building a massive villa, which destroyed half the site. But when I first got went there, the, the, these rooms where these mosaics were, they would be filled with drugs, you know, so apparently you know, drug, drug takers would go there and take their drugs inside. But as time went on, uh, looters would start coming into the store. You know, every time I'd go back, I'd find another room completely destroyed. Uh, and they would, they, you know, they, you know, uh, and they would see like one group of looters would show up. They'd find a a, a pit, a hole that they've uh, another group of found down, you know, dug up, and then they they'd go and dig another one next to it. And and then of course the DOA would come back, refill these holes. Of course the, the mosaics are lost forever. And then another looters, you know, these ignorant looters would come back and start digging them up again. And over the years, like, you know, it's just gotten worse and worse. And the two big trends are, you know, the Jewish gold hidden somewhere, which I always end up fighting with looters over because I enc encounter them often. And then there's the Ottoman gold along the highway, uh, the, the railway. Those are the big two, like, things that people come. And apparently there's apparently uh, like a, a huge market in Turkey for selling fake treasure maps to idiots here. <laughs> <laughs> but there well, is, there is. Yeah. yeah, no, that's a great answer. Thank you. And thank you for the question, because because there is the belief that wherever there's heritage and this isn't just in Jordan, it's right across the Middle East and North Africa, wherever Everywhere. there's archaeological site, there's gold. Yeah. And the more the archaeologists visit. So there's a, there was a Roman fort in the eastern desert in Egypt where a French team weren't digging the fort. They were digging the midden, the rubbish dump, because you understand more about people from their rubbish dump from the, where they lived. And literally the day after the french left they came in with massive bulldozers took, took a quarter of the fort away because they believed there was gold there because the archaeologists had been there so we do have a massive responsibility to try and teach and educate and then the other trend that we've noticed um apart from the looting which has got worse since the pandemic i believe and for as my co-director and i have often commented that we're seeing much more looting on the site but also it's just the population explosion in the last 30 years. So there's much more in terms of road building, dam building, water management, the expansion of villages and towns and everything else and, and, and agriculture. And it's all those factors that are actually having a damaging effect on archeological sites, which is why we're doing what we're doing, continue to do both from satellite imagery and also from air photography. So apart from the, the, you know, the love of the landscape and the love of the heritage, there is a there is an archaeological story to be told. And that's what we're doing. And it's great that Bashar can help us. Uh, we get a message from here from Tricia Salty. And again, if it hadn't been for Tricia, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing now. And she says, thank you so much. Wonderful photos and a very enjoyable presentation. Um, I can't see any other questions. Dima, can you see any uh, in either the chat or the Q&A? No. Uh, so the final question was, where's your favorite place outside Jordan then? Oh, well, so that that's very hard to put pin down. Um, the you're, two allowed, you're allowed three, as I gave you three for Jordan, and we've oh, got a few I, minutes. I don't think I have to. The, the two that come, I always like go with what, what comes to mind. But like, I think, uh, well, coming, I uh, will think about it. So like, first of all, like my last trip to Japan was just absolutely amazing. Um, but and even their even their cultural heritage was just it was beautiful. Like Kyoto was mm. one of those cities where you could spend days just going from temple to temple and exploring and viewing the history. And they really take care of what they do. And the, one of the really cool and interesting things that I learned on the ground was you know the, the certain the Shinto religion that they've got out there is a, a bit of a uh, 
a nature um, religion. And so all their temples are surrounded by these ancient forests that have been untouched for centuries or millennia even. So, you know, you, you get the double whammy of like, you know, exploring these beautiful temples and like seeing this, this, this beautiful, like old foresting, uh, foresting around it. Uh, second place, I would say, uh, second and third were, are in a tie, which is India and uh, Uzbekistan. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And both because of their authenticity in 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 the culture and in the the interaction of the locals with the with their their heritage, mm -hmm. um, you know uh, the Uzbek government they 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 spend a lot of money on restoring these mosques, but they they do it in such a way where they're absolutely beautiful and they you know they're true to what they might have looked like. And the other thing was you know the the local exploration of it. Like when I was in Uzbekistan, like I saw way more local tourism than I saw international tourism, and I love that. And, you know, it was really funny in, in Uzbekistan because, like, I was basically one of the only white people around. So they come up to me and, like, start taking pictures with me. So I've got a, I've got a running joke that, you know, uh, it, there's about 10 households in India and Uzbekistan where, like, I'm on the wall with the family. Uh, <laughs> but well, that's a tradition. It, it is a tradition, isn't it, to take pictures with the tourists? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it was always nonverbal. Yeah. Like, in pictures, I was like, well, okay. Yeah, um yeah. but yeah. uh you know it's 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 just and it's also the the historical uh heritage that they've got you know the the architecture and like the the, the sites just uh, you know you get lost in them yes yeah 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 um there are no, there are no more questions so you are now released um into the the the, the nightlife of a man as you're three hours ahead so it's <laughs> it's getting dark and i don't want anybody to think that that you spend all your time lying down having a sleep but what you have to remember for those of you who haven't been in the helicopter with us, is it is a very different environment and it is very tiring because because your brain is working overtime. Um, and as you can see, Bashar's brain is always working overtime and he is such a creative person and producing such great work. So um, I think we should thank him and also see if we can get him to London and we can have an in-person event as well. Um, maybe to help no, sell his next, his next books or, or make it to the... the um, uh, Festival of Light or Festival of Image Festival in Jordan from the 29th of April. But thank you again, Bashar, and that was All really right. good. <laughs> Speak you. soon. Okay. Bye, guys. Cheers, Em. Bye, everybody.